Do you have any favorites? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> He wants to have the best. The best originals make the best restored. I remember he started off with just one car. Remember the second one he got was a Model A or T. Then all of a sudden it went a little crazy. It's very much an addiction. He's probably the only person that's going to close to 90 that gets out in the tractor in 100 degree heat and goes and plows with no air conditioning. If I could still jump in a tractor at his age, I will be a happy person. First, anybody heard of George is when he bought the Pioneer tractor back in the early 80s for give like $50,000 for everybody thought that was unreal. George was definitely the guy that was like, I'm gonna win that tractor. It's not very often he comes home with an empty trailer. Yeah. I'm not a hoarder though. The rarer the tractor, the better. Just preserving history is what it is through tractors. I would say it's probably some of the best restored stuff there is around. George was one of the first people who really raised the bar on tractor restoration. He loves to take them to the shows, run them, plow with them, thrash with them. Yeah, he likes them looking good too, but he likes them to work. He says, you know, if it breaks, you fix it. It's different when it comes to life, when you get to see it in front of you. He brings rare and unique tractors that you normally don't see at shows. What I think is kind of really cool about it is when I see others that look at what he has. I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm dreaming about George's tractors, so <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> If you come here and look at this stuff, it speaks for itself. You can't pick one favorite out of a collection like this. You, you just can't. And any collector would love to have any of them. Right now, the tractor market is fairly strong, so we're very anxious to see what, what these tractors are going to bring, because these are the best of the best. I'm Amanda Trill, and I imagine if you're here with me today watching Beyond the Block of the Mecham Experience, it's because you have a little tractor fever. Fear not, it's a pretty common condition. For over a century, people have been gathering to celebrate the history and power of these awesome mechanical beasts. Maybe it's the history, maybe it's the camaraderie, but you just can't help but get excited when the gears turn and those engines roar. Tractors have literally changed the landscape of agriculture and have launched us into a whole new world of technology. The saying, they don't make them like they used to, comes to mind. And that's the spark for antique tractor collecting. It's a whole unique, different perspective on collection. There are coin collectors, there are card collectors, and there are t-shirt collectors, but tractor collecting is something new to me until I got acquainted with George. And then I was just amazed at what equipment that he has accumulated over the years. Nestled in Frankfort, Illinois, is the home of George Schaff. He's an avid collector with an eye for quality. Tractor collecting hobby is like a tree, and it's rings around a tree. And the closer you get in there, the smaller the rings get. It's like the more intense the tractor collecting gets, the rarer the tractor is, the smaller the circle gets. The finally you get in the middle of the circle, there's probably only half a dozen, a dozen people in there. And, and out here, you got a lot of people that collect, like the Farm Mall F12s and the John Deere Bs, and there's something for everybody. So where does George rank? George is in that little circle, yes. George likes to collect the rare stuff and have something that uh, nobody else has. <laughs> I just, I like them. And uh, part of it is, is to try to get some of the bigger ones and the older ones. The only problem is they're a little expensive. If there's one thing that George is known for in the tractor world, it's his prairie power. What is it about these hulking beasts that captures the attention of everyone, regardless if tractors are your passion or not?
when they're running, they're, it's like they're breathing fire. It's like they're alive. The noises they make, they shake the ground, they rumble. It's just different than a modern tractor. They're big, they're impressive. You just don't see them at, at every show. If it was up to me, I'd, I'd all have prairie tractors myself. I have one currently. They're a lot of work, but the payoff is huge because it's just had, they just have such a presence to them. You know, a 3060 had 30 horsepower on the draw bar. Today's tractors would have 280 horsepower. Then prairie tractors can pull just as much as the new tractors. Just can't do it as fast. The prairie tractors are massive machines of power that made history in the early 1900s by turning the American sod for the first time. However, these big lugs did their job so well, they became obsolete after about five years. Some were repurposed as stationary power units, while many were scrapped for the war efforts, which has led to their rarity now, and makes them rather attractive for collectors like George. My wife and I went to Will County Fashion Show, and it was one of the first times I had been to a fashion show. I got on the back of one, and the guy let me climb up on it and monkeyed around with it. And I said to my wife, I said, someday I'm going to own one of these big ones. That's how I got started. There's maybe two different types of collectors when it comes to this hobby and the fact that some collect to keep in a museum and, and kind of not use them and kind of show them just in that form in a building. And then there's the guys that will actually take them to shows and work them and use them. And uh, I think it was George that said, if it breaks, you fix it. A lot of this stuff, he'll take it out and work it. Saw, plow, do whatever with it. That was, that was always his big thing, is he wanted to be able to work it, even on the rarest stuff. I mean, we ran it, ran it, ran it for years. I'm telling you, we have broke some expensive tractors. We blew a differential up in an Imperial, plowing with it. I mean, we, we've had some problems, but we just made new parts put it back together and went on. That's part of collecting. No one ever said it was cheap or um, you know frustrating at times, but if you can't run them and drive them, what are you doing? You can go to a museum any day of the week and see this stuff just sitting around, but it's different when it comes to life, when you get to see it in front of you. My favorite has always been his heart par. Ever since I've seen it, it's like, you know, an auction or dreaming of selling something. It's so iconic, you know, to the beginning of tractors. In the early 1900s, the heart par revolutionized the industry of agriculture as the first gasoline powered tractor. This machine gave farmers unimaginable power. You couldn't have a better draw for any show. It's just one of the finest prairie tractors in existence. George has several tractors that could be termed finest in existence. Some might even be the only in existence. Before we dive into his tractors, let's uncover the man behind the collection. Who is George Schaff? Stick with us and find out on Meekum's Beyond the Block. George Schaff, uh, stubborn, honorary, gruff. <laughs> he likes to wave his cane if he's angry. He's a South Sider, you know, if you're from Chicago. A disciplinarian. He likes it his way. He's a man of few words. We started dating, and yeah, to say I had a fear, I had that fear. I left the car running. I would quick get Donna and we'd leave. And there's a lot of sides to George. Hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. The way to, to George is the chocolate cake and chocolate frosting. He's Dutch. He's hardcore Dutch. And he's very proud of that, and he's proud of his heritage. He's no nonsense. Strong. Yeah, he's just tough as nails. All he knows is go, go, go. When people call and ask me and we're talking, friends or random people, they'll say, how is George doing? I said, well, he's driving me nuts, so that means he's all right. Successful businessman. 
never satisfied with just being average or mediocre. Meticulous, he's a hard-working man. When he has an interest and when he has something that he really wants to do, he usually ends up doing really well at it. He knows what he wants, he gets what he wants. When he, George sets his mind on something, you know, that's what he's gonna do. You're not gonna tell George no. He's very good at whatever he does and he makes sure that he is. That is one of the reasons why he has gotten to where he is today is because he's put 100% energy into everything he does. He's probably the only person that's gonna be close to 90 that gets out on a tractor in 100 degree heat and goes and plows. He takes real pride in everything that he does, from athletics to his business to the, the car collection tractors. So it's, it's my dad. It's who he is. There are obviously a number of ways to describe George Schaff. After spending quite a bit of time talking with his family and friends, I would have to say a defining theme is George's grit and determination. It was this that led to the creation of Schaff Window Company, which is now the largest window company in Illinois. He no longer is directly involved in the business, but he still likes to, to know what's going on. He still likes to retain the title of president because it's his business. My dad and I started it in 1959, and it was a chef class company, and we were glazing contractors at that time. It's evolved a little bit with what we do, but we sell windows, doors, millwork, lots of different things. Over its 60 years in business, delivering the highest quality and best value has been the pride of this family-run company. Most of my family has been involved in it at one time or the other. There was no favoritism other than having the opportunity to continue to move up. It wasn't handed to him. He worked hard to do that and like anything it's going to start small but now it's past small. He obviously worked very hard in his company back in the day and he would come home from work at night, have dinner and go back to work and load the trucks. He would work tirelessly to make sure that he was successful and I think that does translate into his tractors and just making sure that everything is done right regardless of how much time he has to put into it. But how exactly did George get into collecting? I started it in about 1984. And part of the reason for starting it, I had a back operation, and before that I was pretty much involved in sports, and I had to give up all sports. When he had his back issues came up, I mean at the time, you know, he could no longer play softball, he could no longer golf, which was in his late 40s to early 50s is when those things kind of ended for him. He's just an active person that needed something to do. If it ain't work, it was messing with this stuff. And the restorations and the kind of stuff that he buys is the reflection of his attitude. I like the competition and I like to win. Don't let the overalls fool you. Prior to his back surgery, George was quite the athlete. Let's take a deeper dive on where his competitive nature comes from. It is our family. Everybody in the family is competitive. We grew up going to my dad's ball games and we all played ball, played basketball, ran track. We've all played softball, we've played basketball, did golf. In high school I played football, ran track, and skied. I played baseball and basketball. Between all five of us kids, the gamut, we pretty much played them all. And this family's success in sports didn't end in high school or college. Bob actually played in the minor leagues for the LA Dodgers organization, and Barb played on team handball for the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. The apples didn't fall far from the tree. What was George's claim to fame? I played a lot of, lot of 16 inch softball. He was a 16 inch softball player for decades, and he is in the Chicago Softball Hall of Fame. A big round of applause for George Schaff. George Schaff. Thank you, George. My years of playing ball, coaching at all levels, organizing leagues, building facilities are memories that I am proud to be a part of and will cherish forever. Thank you, George. I don't know. I guess I must have been a pretty good player. 
Everybody doesn't get in, so it, I guess it's a good honor. His days of excellence are not over. George has simply transitioned from power hitter to prairie power. The competitive nature of, you know, of George playing sports, maybe that's how he ended up with some of the tractors, you know, sitting across from somebody, you know. I think George was definitely the guy that was like, I'm gonna win that tractor. That athletic part of you where you always want to be the best or strive to be the best and, and do your best. And I think he he is definitely wants to have the best collection and pursue the unpursuable, you know, get that rare, unique tractor or car. George called me up one day and wanted me to come visit him. And uh, he had just had uh, back surgery, a major back surgery. He wasn't able to uh, go to an auction in Kansas. It was a huge estate sale. He wanted me to go to the auction and uh, buy the tractors for him. And uh, I'd never done that before. So uh, I said to George, I don't, I don't have any money to uh, buy these tractors for you. He said, well, I want you to bid on them. I said, well, how much you want me to bid? And he said, I want you to take them home. Uh, it's really easy to bid on them when it's not your money. And with George, um, when it comes to an auction, George has no friends. One of my other customers was at an auction and he was bidding on a tractor. And George was standing right beside him. All of a sudden he looked over. George bid on the same tractor he was. It didn't matter to George. George said, like, yeah, 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 I'll yeah. He just he said, it didn't matter. If he wants something, it friends, it don't matter, he, he, he buys it. And George don't like to go to an auction with an, and come home with an empty trailer. George doesn't like uh, coming home with empty trailers. And we've heard that numerous times. I'm not going home with an empty trailer. Has he ever had a tractor get away? Not too many. I've been fortunate enough to have had quite a few. I mean, I don't know the number, but if I look back, all the different vehicles I've had, I'm probably over 400, so that, that's quite a few. But the quality here is what stands out more than anything. It's not necessarily the model or a particular type of machine, it's the quality of the machines. I couldn't have said it better. George has raised the bar for restorations among the tractor community. Up next, we'll take a peek in the shop and see how George aspires for perfection when it comes to restoring the finds from his treasure hunts. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Beyond the Block of the Mecham Experience. The George and June Shaft Tractor and Truck Museum stands above the rest because each piece is a labor of love. When he sets his mind to restoring it, I, I really think he, he, he just goes full. You know, he goes all out. I would say it's probably some of the best restored stuff there is around. And you usually don't see that with big prairie tractors, you know, with all the iron and the equipment it takes to do that and the time, the time it takes to do that. I wish I had the patience to do something like that or, or the, the skill, you know, but that my talent doesn't go that far. People come here and look that are restorers of cars, trucks, and they can't believe how well they do. Uh, compared it to others, his are the best. A lot of times when people fix tractors, it's like, well, we, can't, we can't do it this way because it costs too much money. We can't do it this way because it costs too much money. George wants to do it right. Years ago, you could tell a George tractor when it showed up just because it, it looked so much different than the other ones that were out there. The, the look, the quality set it apart. People were doing a nice job in the 70s, the 80s, 90s on cars, but nobody had seen it yet on a tractor. I would say that George was one of the first people who really raised the bar on tractor restoration. Now it's evolved the fact where, you know, we buy that and it becomes much more valuable that they're spending a lot of money on it. So now it's like they come here and they look at the tractors, and they see what the standards are, then they go home and they try to make theirs to George's standards. He doesn't just want it to be okay. He just doesn't want it to be so-so. And that's his personality where if he's going to do it, he wants to do it right. And he wants to have the best. This crank was busted up. So we weld it back together. I bonded it up. We get the shape that we want. Send it out to the caster. And this is what we get back. He really wants to replicate 
you know, kind of how it was in its original state to bring it back to life. He likes a lot of detail as far as even using the correct bolts, you know, the square head bolts and no Phillips heads, obviously, because that wasn't around then. Everything slotted. I want it done the right way. Let's put it that way. If it doesn't run, he don't like it. He loves to take them to the shows, run them, plow with them, thrash with them. Yeah, he likes them looking good too, but he likes them to work. Fired up. And he likes them, you know, obviously to start right up and go there and crank them a few times and they start up and drive. Well, a lot of stuff gets taken all the way down to the bottom, all the way down to the bare frame, pull the engine apart. Bill will get all new sheet metal for everything. Everything gets painted with automotive paint. I mean, there's just really, there's hardly any stone left unturned. But how in the heck do they do it? Take a lot of pictures first, tear them all apart, pay attention to what you take apart. Whatever's broke, you try to get that out as soon as possible, because you might be waiting on it, especially machining parts. And, you know, even sheet metal and stuff, if you've got to get something made, try to get it out as soon as you can. Yeah, then start putting it back together. The biggest thing people want to cut corners on, and it totally leaves me bewildered, is paint nowadays can go for as much as $1,000 a gallon. And everybody squirms you sell $1,000 a gallon, but if you figure the hundreds and hundreds of hours that they put in to getting this stuff ready to paint, the price of paint is nothing compared to the labor. And anything can look good right away. But if you don't use the good quality paint, over years the paint will peel, it'll fade, and it'll just look really cruddy. So how do you do a stellar paint job? It's all in the prep. If you don't sand it properly and prime it and sand it again and get the finish the way you want before you paint it, then you're not gonna have a good paint job. And of course, how you lay it on. And a good gun. And a little bit of experience. I guess that all, that all kinds of comes in together. And you gotta be relaxed. If you go under tents painting, you're not gonna have a good paint job. When he sees it at a show and other people see it and, and uh, people comment about it and you know, say, oh, this, you know, it's how, how good it is, how beautiful it is. I think that's what, you know, inside that's what makes him, you know, feel good about what he's done and what he's had the guys do for him. The interesting thing is, is his shed, it changes routinely. I mean, this is his fourth auction. So from a dollar perspective, it's, you know, it's been millions and millions over the years, obviously. But I don't think it, the dollar value is as important as the time and the energy that he puts into all of his tractors. They're just, when he restores the tractor, at the end of the day, it's just an impeccable restoration. It's just something you don't hardly see anywhere else. There's a lot of pride, and George is really picky on how he wants things done. Turn the key, make sure it works. If I'm going to give it to somebody else, and somebody's going to pay uh, you know, like in bigger tractors, they're going to pay, say, 100000 and up. Um, they should get it the right way. I think they're going to get the best. We put a lot into these tractors, and we don't usually take any shortcuts. And very conscious about what he puts into these. So the ones that we restore, we, we, we put our heart and souls in them. It's just been fun to watch him go from being a frame to, you know, taking it apart and sandblasting to seeing him finished. When you look at the George and June Shaft Tractor and Truck Museum, you will not miss the artistry of George's restoration team. There's no denying they have some serious talent. I have a lot of respect for Bill and Dan as mechanics and, and Justin in the same way. They're very knowledgeable in this old equipment. In fact, the other day I was here and I was talking to Justin as he was pulling on wrenches and I said, what is the uh, torque on that bolt? He says, you show me the book and I'll tell you what the torque should be on that bolt. And I said, I don't think there's a book that's made. He says, there isn't, you just have to know. Every machine you get, when you look at it, it tells a story. But being able to read the book is the, that's where the trouble comes in sometimes, is can you read the book? And sometimes if you work together with other people and we'd all put our heads together on this stuff, we could figure out, okay, this piece goes with that, that piece is missing. So, you know, what are we gonna do here? For some of these really rare tractors, there always isn't a reference 
There isn't a book, there isn't anything. You just have to use common sense and building practices of the time. I understand the 1938 Monarch snow motor is a perfect example of this. So I found that snow motor form out in Lake Tahoe. We didn't know, even know what it was. It had the big tag on the back of it, so we knew it was called a snow motor, but just thought it would be interesting to fix up because it was so unique. I get the snow motor back here and we start working on it, and it only had the front half to it, just the snow motor part of it. Nobody could figure out how it turned, but it had cables hanging out of the back of it. I said, it, it has to articulate. How are you gonna make a single track turn left or right? You have to make it hinge in the center to make it go one way or the other. His housekeeper, Deb, she found a magazine or something, showed a picture of it on the front of the magazine, showed the sled behind it, showed how it articulated. You know, there's a couple other machines out there that are similar to it, but they went to a dual track design because the steering on them isn't that good. And I don't think any of them are really a regular production. They were all kind of hand built for a specific purpose. Whether it was to haul skiers or equipment in a lot of snow, there's no argument on how people feel about it. It's cool as hell. <laughs> I promise we have a lot more coming up that will give you the same reaction on Beyond the Block. I know what you're wondering. What might be the most standout tractor from the George and June Shaft Tractor and Truck Museum? The Little Oak. That's an unusual one. It's a super rare tractor and possibly the only one that exists. The ones that are rare rare are the ones that were failures. Wait, what? There was just a lot of awkward things about it, so that's a rare tractor because it just didn't pan out. It's restored beautifully. It also has the factory plow option behind it. The plow was part of the tractor, so you had to use it for plowing. You couldn't really use it for a lot of other things just because it was dedicated to a plow. It's very much ahead of its time. It advertises the one-man tractor. You see a lot of people, you know, they got to start them with a big flywheel, and this has got the lever, you know, right next to the operator so he can do it all himself and then he can lower the plow, which is way ahead of its time. I mean, it was a great idea, but it didn't work out so well. This is really styled. If you put yourself back in the teens, it was very, very advanced. It's just that it's a different tractor when you see how it's made. I knew about that tractor quite a few years before I bought it. So when it came up for auction, I went after it, and I got it. But it was a tough restoration. From an engineering standpoint and aesthetics and collectability, I mean, I don't think it would get much better than having something like that. There's no doubt the 1917 Wilmer Little Oak is a fan favorite. But what other gems inside the Shaft Museum have tractor collectors excited? You know, I've got International Type A. That's the beginning of International Harvester, one of their first models. The Altman Taylor, that's nice because that was Altman Taylor's last hurrah before they got bought out by Rumley. Little Sawyer Massey is cute as a bug, you know, I like little Sawyer Massey. Of course, I'm from Ohio, so he's got a Sandusky tractor up there, which is built in Ohio, which has a little bit of a, a pull onto my heartstrings. I mean, the Hart Power is always a nice tractor. His 4072 is nice, Pioneer. What about the one-of-a-kind 1920 Stinson 1836 and the 1917 Hume 2030 HP? I'm not gonna be picky, they're all nice. He has almost every Avery ever made, every size. Nobody's ever done that, so that's a big deal. You can come here and you can see everything that Avery made. I don't know why they made so many different models, but he's got the big 4080 with the round radiator, the big 4080 with the flat automotive radiators. He's got it both ways. And, all the way down to the 512s. You never see any more Avery's, I don't think, in one place. Along with his tractors, George has some really quality trucks. One of my favorites is his 37 Ford V8. It's just got the look, the stance, they call it. His case car is one of the nicest brass cars I've been around. Of course, I've got international auto wagons. I see his auto wagon, it looks just as good on the inside as it does on the outside. 
and his large-scale neon signs representing each of the ag equipment and tractor manufacturers from the first half of the 20th century will make your jaw drop. I'm, I'm a kid in a candy store. Not many people could say that they could just have people over to their house and have a show. In 2020, when the tractor shows were canceled due to COVID, that's exactly what George did for the tractor community, right on his own property. That was really special. We were able to drive a bunch of tractors. We kind of had our own little parade. That was a really, really nice time. If you haven't noticed, there are two names listed on the Shaft Tractor and Truck Museum. June Schaff is George's late wife who passed in 2004. Whatever George was up to, June was sure to be right there with love and support. She was a very nice lady. Well, like her out at the shows, you know, you want a water, you want a sandwich. I mean, just as nice as pie. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't get any nicer. She was very down to earth. She was very common. She was, she was a great person, great to talk to. I think she was George's best friend. Well, my mom was kind of like the, kind of like the glue. She just did everything for the family. She was the voice. Very different than my dad, right. <laughs> she was such a supporter of whatever we wanted to do. From sports to kids to collecting, June backed it all up. I had a good wife, so never had a problem. And a lot of guys always ask me, you know, did your wife trying to stop you, hanging on to you. No, she was the other way. Go ahead and bid. Sometimes when they didn't want to bid, she'd tell me to go ahead. That became, you know, their thing to do. She loved going to those shows too. She liked traveling. She loved it when family came with. I think if you probably asked her, she would love to sit somewhere on a beach or something like that, you know, instead of a, you know, a, a dirty, messy uh, tractor show sometimes, but she enjoyed it because she knew that he enjoyed it. Anything they would, could do together, I think that's what made them happy. Maybe June and George were meant to be because, you see, she was also an avid collector. It was a hobby they were able to share as husband and wife. As far as the museum goes, June's collection manifested in a beautiful and large assembly of dolls. I was big hearted. I gave her a room in my building so she could collect dolls. So. How sweet of you. Yeah, wasn't it? She would see a doll she'd like and collect them. You know, so it didn't really matter what it was. It was just she always liked to collect dolls and that's why we have that whole collection there. Then she started getting them as the grandkids were born. She would look for some that had the names, you know, that would correspond, you know. It, same thing. Start off with a few and that got a little, uh, I think that got out of control too. But They both like to collect. June collected hundreds of dolls, including dolls from the Ashton Drake Galleries, Franklin Mint, Danbury Mint, and more. That includes the 1989 Grand Duchess of Anastasia, adorned with 22 karat gold. Most of them are porcelain. If you dropped it, it would probably break, but there's precious moments, dolls, when, you know, then there's a lot of brides, a lot of Barbies, teddy bears, I think, still in there, and there's just really no rhyme or reason, it's just collections to different things. They're mostly fancy looking, though. My wife has a doll collection as well, so there was a connection there that I don't know much about it, and he knew nothing about his wife's dolls, so between the two of us, we could commiserate about how much we did not know about dolls. I did get surprised. I looked at the list and then I looked what they cost. Good thing I didn't know it at that time. <laughs> so. Oh, George. I wouldn't complain too much, though, because from what I hear, there are some things she could call you out on, mister. Bless June's heart. Um, I rode once with George in his truck. June was an angel because George drives. We were, we, were, we were going back from the show, and he said, get in there with me, ride with Wendell. And I got in the truck with him, and he decided to pass somebody. And there was a semi coming. 
and it didn't matter to George. He just kept right on driving, the semi kept coming, and it's a little jumper seat. Poor June was sitting on a jumper seat over there. June was an angel. So if she rode with George, all them, all them, she had nerves of steel. And on that note, hang tight for more Beyond the Block of the Mecham Experience. And always remember to buckle up. Another piece of George's collection worth mentioning is the opposite of his prairie tractor behemoths. In reference to size, that is. The number of toys he has collected over the years literally ticks over into the thousands. Of course, with George Schaff at the helm, quantity does not outdo quality. His toys, they're handcrafted, they add chrome, they add duels, they add front wheel assist. You know, he doesn't just got toys, he's got the best. Lots of tractors, lots of trucks. I would hate to see if one of the kids took one out and started playing, we'd probably find out what they're actually playing with. I just wanted something in the museum. You know, people come to look. I had been collecting some of those even before I got into, into tractors. Some of the Danbury men and the Franklin Mint toys. So that's how I got involved in that. My one son, he liked them. He would go and get them or buy them and then turn around and let me pay for them. So. I pushed him a little bit more on, oh, you bought that tractor? Let me go find the toy for you and you know, add that to the collection. Him and I went to a couple of auctions where we bought some of the toys at the auction. And then gradually, you know, started out with a couple and then you end up with a couple hundred. George's expansive museum is an even greater treasure because he's taken such great steps to share it with others. I've taken him to a few auctions and taking to an auction is not as simple as it seems. You gotta hop in his big red RV that really is a truck and you got to haul a big massive trailer on the back and I said okay uh, you know because I'm always up for anything I'll, I'll give it a shot at this time George really couldn't drive for very long so I ended up doing most of the driving and I'm sitting there you know white knuckled all the way and he doesn't understand that because it's just second nature to him and you're not used to hauling that stuff. no I'm an accountant <laughs> What it really sees is when you go to the shows or when people come here to the museum and they're like, they just, oh, wow. You know, they're so excited. It just brings a lot of joy and excitement to other people. And I think part of that, you know, is what satisfies him too. George, over the years, has had an abundance of different types of prairie tractors, medium-sized tractors that normally I wouldn't have had the chance to learn how to run. I wouldn't be with you where I am today if it wasn't for George and operating the things that I've operated. George says, hold on. He said, if, if you're going to want to drive this thing, you're going to need to start it yourself. And he had a little grin on his face. And so I'm like, OK. So we started it, drove it through the parade. And it was actually a highlight of my tractor collecting because that, to me, that tractor is just amazing. And actually, it's my wife's favorite tractor, too. George was one of the first people to ever give me a chance to learn how to work on this stuff, to be able to do this. I would say if it wasn't for George, I wouldn't be where I'm at today with knowing how to fix this stuff because every kind of shape, size, style of equipment there was, George had it here. He can be quiet, he can be tough, but he does have a big heart. He says he's been blessed and he wants to share that with others. There's another reason that I collect it too. I'm most everything is going to charity. And I always said, God gave me some toys to play with, and someday I'm going to give them back. Well, the greatest thing about everything is that majority, if not all the money, is over the years, this is now his fourth auction, has gone to charity. He wants to help people out, and that's what 
I think the true value of what is in his shed is he's, he wants to give back to the community and his Christian values. For this auction, there are too many charities to count. But to provide some scale for his giving, George was a primary contributor of the athletic field expansion for Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois. The project took the better part of a decade to complete, and in 2013, it was rightfully christened the George and June Schaff Athletics Complex. I think it's more than just the tractors themselves. I think it's the community. He just fits right in with the community of tractor collectors and tractor people, and he just loves it. His love for the hobby is evident in each piece of George's museum, along with his eye for restoration perfection. You know, we always say once in a lifetime, but this really is truly something I think you want to come see in person. And these machines represent a lot of history, a lot of George's history, a lot of American history. It's a nice thing to come and see and appreciate what the farmers did back then. I mean, can you imagine going on one of these things and working them all day long? It's a lot of work. So I, I got a deep appreciation for the farmers that had to do this stuff to make a living and feed everybody. I think it's great that they're preserved and you know, maybe another collector will start collecting them and keep them going. Do we really think this closes the book on George's collecting days? What is this, auction number four, I think it is. We heard, I don't know how many times, that that's it, I'm not doing it again. So who knows, maybe we're still gonna have one more after this. I really don't think so though. But he said the first auction was the, you know, oh, I'm done then. Well, we're on auction number four, so what does that tell you, you know? I bet he still buys something. He ain't gonna give it up till he's gone. He's selling his toys, stuff out, which he hasn't sold before, which is neat, you know, and there's a lot of nice signs here and a lot of nice tractors here. And right now the tractor market is fairly strong, so we're very anxious to see what these tractors are gonna bring, because these are the best of the best. You can't pick one favorite out of a collection like this. You, you just can't. And any collector would love to have any of them. Me as a collector, if I'm buying a tractor here, I'd feel like I'm buying a piece of George, a piece of history, a piece of George. I couldn't agree more. I'm Amanda Trudell, and it's been a pleasure taking you beyond the block for a peek at the man behind the George and June Shaft Tractor and Truck Museum. This is a spectacular offering, and Mecham Gone Farman is honored to have the opportunity to work with the one and only George Schaff. It means a lot to me that someone like George would even consider us. We believe over the years we've grown the tractor division to be the best. For him to feel that way validates that. We're looking forward to backing it up and selling one of the best collections ever offered. I would say that Mecham's going the extra mile to really represent it in the way that it needs to be represented to show the quality, the real quality here. To describe it, I like our tagline that we came up with for those who want the best. That's what I hope I am. That this will be some of the best tractors that are out there. Climb aboard, line them up, get them up on the block, making deals, moving steel, it's something you gotta try, let's get the auction started, come on, let's go, it's time for me, comes gone, farming show.